Good morning, everybody. Um, I can see you all beginning to come in, so that's fantastic. Uh, welcome to the latest webinar with Great Place to Work. Um, thank you for, for your time and thank you for, for being with us today. Um, means you're safe and well, which is always uh, uh, wonderful for, for us to see. Um, as usual, you might pop into the chat box, let me know if you can see the screen, if you can hear us all, um, just to make sure that everything is, is working well on all of your sides as well. Um, so you can just pop that into, into that chat box. Um, for those of you logging on for the weekly weather update from Mayo, the rain is back. We've had a month of, of dry weather now, um, but the, uh, the, the rain is back this morning. So, uh, but the garden is happy, so that's a good thing. Um, Morning, Holly. That's great. Delighted you can you can hear us. Um, brilliant. It seems that a few of you are able to hear us and see us. That's great. Um, so as I said, welcome to the latest Great Place to Work Staying Connected webinar. Um, today's theme is all around our COVID-19 care survey. Um, we're going to be going through some preliminary findings and we're delighted to welcome uh, an expert panel from the Great Place to Work community as well. On today's call, we're going to have uh, Jim Flynn and Joseph Benkin and Green taking us through the kind of great place to work piece. Um, and Jim is going to be introing the, the expert panel shortly. Uh, just a bit of housekeeping. So we will be sharing uh, the slides and the recording at the end of today's session. So I know how much you all love to furiously write notes, but hopefully we'll be able to, to cover off a bit of that anyway uh, during the session. Um, we are aiming to be wrapped up in the hour. We do have quite a few voices on, on the session today, um, but we are aiming to be, to be done by uh, 11 a.m. As usual, please keep your questions coming. Uh, for those of you who've been on the last couple of sessions, I know we've been mainly doing it through the chat function. We have a new Q&A function this morning as well. So feel free to pop questions into, into either of those. Um, and I'll be either addressing the panelists or we, if we have time, we'll be doing it in the Q&A at the end. Final piece from me this morning. Um, we have next week's webinar ready to go and invites will be, will be following this. Uh, we're delighted to be welcoming Gary Keegan um, all around championing your warrior mindset next week. So do continue to keep this 10 a.m. Thursday slot free, free for the Great Place to Work webinars. Okay, great. Uh, good morning, Elaine. Thanks very much for, for saying hi. Um, and without delay, I am going to pass over to Jim Flynn. So thanks everybody and chat to you soon. Over to you, Jim. Thanks very much, Fania. Um, my name is Jim Flynn. I'm one of the partners in Great Place to Work. And uh, thankfully, I know quite a few of you, so I'm delighted to welcome you on to our call this morning. Uh, and I'd also like to introduce you to our very esteemed panel this morning. Um, it's a great reflection of the community that's involved in terms of Great Place to Work with the expertise that we have here. So we've expertise from very large multinational, uh, from uh, entrepreneurship on both sides and then also from in relation to health so a qualified pharmacist and a uh, doctor indeed uh, as, as, as a dentist so so first of all let me introduce it to Mary Mary uh, Mary Ryan is the managing director of Credit Agricole Insurance in Dublin Credit Agricole is otherwise known as the Green Bank uh, it's the largest cooperative financial institution in the world We've got 150,000 employees, I think, Mary. Right. And uh, Mary manages the Dublin uh, office. Uh, Mary joined Credit Agricole in 2006, became Deputy General Manager in 2010, and has been the Managing Director since 2017. Uh, I've had the pleasure of working with Mary since 2013, myself, uh, and through the Great Place to Work Network. And we've been on that journey with Credit Agricole in Dublin. Um, Credit Agricole is a best workplace and a best workplace for women this year again and uh, delighted to to welcome Mary and and her expertise. Uh, she has overcome some challenges in her life including being from Tipperary and I particularly admire her for that so, uh, <laughs> so glad to have her here. Um, Thank you Jim. <laughs> Uh, Una, Una is a pharmacist uh, she, uh, and also an entrepreneur. So she is the owner of uh, the pharmacy group. She uh, first qualified as a pharmacist and bought her first shop from her mentor. Um, she now has a total of nine shops, I think it is, Una. That's uh, right. Yeah. And is particularly proud of her clicks and bricks strategy in terms of, of having bought a strong online presence and the, continuing to develop and innovate 
and drive. So she has all that medical expertise, that entrepreneurship expertise, and a focus on people and the importance of that. Um, total of 96 employees and uh, now is, is also a best workplace uh, this year. And of course, we also have Niall, who um, graduated Trinity in 2003 as a, as a dentist, um, esta established uh, Tree Dental, uh, with this, uh, that has offices uh, on the Nace Road in Dublin and in Limerick uh, in 2016, has over 90 employees, and um, is again, you know, one of those uh, slightly frustrating people from my point of view, who's, who's both heavily qualified, quite charming, and a very successful entrepreneur. So delighted to have that experience with us this morning, and thank you for, for joining us. So, um, move just, I suppose, move, moving on, just going to touch briefly on the agenda of what we're going to discuss this morning. Um, the expert panel, we're going to talk to each of you individually, and please, any questions that you have for that expert panel, please pop them along to Fania, and we'll moderate those as they go along. Um, so we'll be looking at what insights, that, what, what experiences that you've had so far in terms of managing um, this pandemic within your organization, the impact it has on individuals, and some practical things that you found have worked well. Um, we're then going to go into, Joseph is going to speak a bit, little bit about how it is we set up our initial findings in terms of the COVID survey. Uh, and we're also going to look at these four areas of communication, well-being, organizational support, and enablement, which we've looked at under the survey and what the output of that has been so far. So these are initial findings. We wanted to get them into your hands so that you could make practical use of them. They're not the final um, output yet, uh, but but we wanted to, we, we thought time was of the essence in order to make these practical and available to you. We're then going to end up with some actionable insights and some focus areas that you might decide to share with your management cohort afterwards. And hopefully this will be some practical things. It might be a little bit like a checklist. Some things you might be doing already, some of the things that you might not, but just to focus on these are the things that we know are working at the minute and we have validated them through direct experience with best workplaces and also through the survey responses. So we know these things work and we'd encourage you to, to uh, get whatever value you can from them and, and possibly uh, let us know how you're getting on. And then at that point, we'll take any questions and answers. So we, we've quite a packed agenda. We'll be moving at a fair pace and uh, looking forward to getting stuck into that. Okay. So Mary, if I could start with yourself, um, wh what's been your experience so far? So I suppose um, Credit Agricole, uh, just to give you just a brief insight, we've 120 staff, as you mentioned here in Dublin, very diverse workforce. So more than 20 nationalities represented uh, within that 120 staff. We have a branch in Milan, a branch in Paris also. So our experience, I suppose, uh, from the outset was we were following uh, the Italian situation very closely because of our branch uh, based there uh, in Milan. Um, from the point, I suppose, where um, COVID started to move outside of China, uh, we immediately started planning uh, within the offices here in Dublin. So end of January already we had started um, planning via our Health and Safety Committee um, as regards to uh, very close monitoring uh, of the situation. Uh, from the outset, I'd say the health, safety and well-being uh, of our staff has been a priority, a key priority for us. And we acted very early in terms of uh, moving to home working in that regard. Uh, communication has been critical throughout, um, communication um, literally from uh, the top down, uh, communication in terms of updates from authorities, updates from health and, health and health service executive, from chief medical officer, knowing that the profile of our staff are not, uh, for the most part, native English speakers uh, who uh, are more, more than likely following the news in their home country more than they would be here locally. So we had to be very uh, conscious and cautious that 
the guidelines from the authorities were being um, fed through to our staff, that they were aware of what's happening on the ground here locally uh, in Ireland. Uh, communication in terms of our internal planning, uh, very clear structured planning, uh, what we were going to do, when we were going to do it. Um, and of course, uh, updates in terms of business impacts uh, as and when those, uh, those arise. I suppose what the Pulse survey from Great Place to Work um, has given us really is um, anonymous feedback, which helped us, I suppose, identify what works really well in assisting each individual responding to this crisis in their own uh, unique way. And we found the survey very useful let's say, in that regard. So we could see what works well, what we need to continue doing and what we need to do more of. Um, I suppose in terms of um, our, um, our managers, um, our managers have been critical in, this, in, in the entire um, management of this crisis. Um, we've involved all of our managers in our crisis management committees from very earlier on uh, to ensure that they were equipped with um, a consistent message that they could pass on to their teams at any point in time. And we encouraged uh, consistent message, consistent communication at regular intervals with uh, individuals and teams throughout the organization. When we moved, I suppose, on the 12th of March, we made the decision when uh, Leo announced that anybody who should work from home, um, who could work from home, sorry, should work from home, uh, we took the step uh, on the 12th of March to um, uh, allow everybody to uh, work from home. So our first day effectively of home working was uh, 13th of March. So we equipped the teams with tools to enable them uh, to remain connected to enable them to communicate. So we're, we're using the platform Microsoft Teams um, to encourage connectivity communications uh, among the teams. Uh, at our managers uh, management level, we encourage them to have daily team meetings. And I do that myself with my own senior team uh, within the organization. We meet at 12 o'clock every day. Uh, we talk about business. We talk about uh, how everybody is getting on, how they're managing uh, the crisis uh, thus far as we progress and advance through it. And we encourage our managers to do the same with their teams, um, both on a team uh, meeting level, but also on an individual level. Again, very conscious that people are responding uh, in a diff in very differently from one to the other, uh, depending on their uh, own situations there. And I suppose what's what's important to mention, and Jim, you'll be you'll be well aware of this. Um, we have um, invested heavily in our leadership development over the past eighteen months. Let's say. And it's really now that we see that we're, we're reaping the rewards of that investment effectively. We have a, a team of managers who are quite competent, very confident in delivering uh, messages to their teams um, in a consistent way. And uh, being able to, uh, I suppose, communicate transparently and have the courage to say at times, we don't have all of the answers, you know, and we'll come back to you regarding, for example, business impacts that may not be entirely clear at this stage. So uh, managers are playing a critical role. So I'll be very interested uh, in the section again, uh, the focus on managers uh, this morning. Um, we find that um, what the management layer within the organization are doing is managing very well upwards and downwards and trans transmitting messages, let's say, uh, identifying perhaps an individual that might be struggling uh, and passing that on, alerting early so that we can help them and assist them with uh, our wellbeing programs, our employee assist programs, for example, just uh, some ideas. Um, we're, we're putting a strong focus, as I said, on, on health, safety and wellbeing. We developed uh, our daily wellbeing tips, which go out every morning to all staff. And there are around five uh, key themes, um, stay connected, be active, take notice, keep learning and giving. So um, each day there's a different, um, each one of those are developed in different ways. It could be around building resilience. It could be around taking the opportunity in the moment. Uh, it could be around uh, learning how to bake that cake that you always wanted to bake, for example, or even take up a new skill like hurling, being from Tipperary, I'd have to get that one in there. <laughs> 
<laughs> it would be a new uh, skill after all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had, to, had to get you back on that. Um, <laughs> So we, we've reallocated budgets, for example, that we would have used in the office for uh, fruit deliveries, offering uh, home uh, fruit hampers, uh, food hampers, for example, on a day where we feel that it's the last thing somebody might be expecting somebody to arrive at the door with a beautiful fruit hamper. And we find that that makes a difference. Uh, we've had excellent feedback on that. Um, I spoke about the employee assistance program. We've online GP service uh, through that program, which works very well and was a great comfort for people, certainly in the earlier stages where they may not have been able to secure a GP appointment. Mm -hmm. And then on the fitness side, I suppose we, we offer, um, we moved what we would have run in the office normally, let's say would have been body balance um, and various exercise. So we moved those straight away to uh, um, online. So we've body balance going out twice a week on Zoom. We have body attack and body combat, which I hear are quite tough going out twice a week also for stuff <laughs> to maintain, let's say that active um, fitness on days when the weather is like it is up in Mayo, it's the same in Dublin today, where people may not get out, let's say that they can get the exercise and the fitness um, ticked off uh, indoors as well. So all in all, I suppose we've um, health, safety, well-being, communication um, critical uh, for us um, at all levels within the organisation. We've had really very positive feedback, um, delighted with the results of the survey so far. We feel like we're doing the right things and our survey anonymously told us that we're on the right track and we want to keep that going consistently as the weeks go on, as the experience may be getting that little bit tougher. Uh, for some people, depending on their own individual situation. One of the things I understand, Mary, is that regardless of whether or not you have something to communicate, you hold those meetings anyway. Could you talk to me a little bit more about that? Absolutely. Um, it's, it, it's very easy, I suppose, to to say my agenda is packed today, I'll, I'll spare a bit of time there. We've nothing to update um, at, at our 12 o'clock session every day. And I'm very... Uh, regimental almost um, in um, saying to the teams, regardless of whether you have an update, whether you don't have an update, the fact that you get together, you keep that connection with your team. Um, it could be the day that you find out that one of your team is struggling the most and that would be the value of holding that session on that mm -hmm. given day. Um, you know, um, there are there are times, I suppose, when uh, when we're all busy with 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 various uh, agenda items or with business updates or board meetings to prepare, whatever the case may be, it's important that we take the time to ask each other also how are we feeling on any uh, given day, regardless of your level within the organisation. One of the other things that you've always been very competent uh, with is is managing diversity. How many nationalities do you have again, Mary? We have 20 nationalities um, among 120 staff. Yeah, mm -hmm. so quite a diverse, um, quite a diverse workforce. Um, diverse also in terms of personal situation. So I mentioned at the outset, um, people um, join us in Dublin because we, we, we're supporting a pan-European market out of Dublin. So we would have people joining us who would have very few words of English perhaps, right? Um, so what's important for us is that our communication is simple and clear. It can be easily understood by everybody. Um, and that we keep people well up to date and well informed on uh, what's happening via the authorities uh, here uh, in Ireland. Diversity, I suppose, also in terms of personal uh, situations. So some of those um, staff who greatly, by the way, enrich the culture of, uh, of Credit Agricole here in Dublin, um, they have diverse uh, situations. So their office could be a flat share, for example, in rat mines. It could be um, a family situation with uh, children of crash going age. It could be um, a family situation with kids uh, of school going age, such as mine, um, where you're trying to juggle uh, a very busy uh, professional life with uh, monitoring uh, schoolwork and taking yourself back to the days of Gaelga and uh, what does this mean, for example. Um, and, and, and I suppose we've a diverse profile there um, 
and we have to be very conscious uh, to everybody's situation that everyone's situation is unique and different. And what we've been very clear on from the outset is that we trust everybody to do their very best on any given day. And we know some, day, pe some days people will have good days, some days people will have bad days, um, but we trust people and we will be flexible with everybody depending on their own uh, situation. And I think I, I heard a quote uh, during the week, I, I can't remember where it came from, but I suppose what we're going through now is working from home, working at home during a crisis as opposed to home working. And there's a difference. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, uh, I think that says a lot. Um, people will uh, experience this crisis in many different ways and, and we have to be very conscious uh, of that. Thanks very much, Mary. I, I think we could chat for a, a lot longer. We come back to, to some questions and answers, hopefully at the end. Um, if I could move on to, to yourself, Niall, um, could you tell me a little bit about what, you know, a completely different context uh, out, out at the Red Cow and in, and in Limerick. How, how's your experience been? Sure, well, first, thanks for the introduction, Jim. I, I think I was successful up until last month uh, and this all kicked off. Um, in terms of uh, our experience, there, there are parallels to what Mary was saying there, even though there are very different scales in business. Um, I think one of the the few advantages our profession had in this whole crisis was that we were very used to uh, mitigating risk from infection. Um, so, you know, when the murmurings from the East were coming in January, uh, we were sort of watching in, in, in trepidation. Um, and I, I think a key to our success was to kind of anticipate what was happening. Uh, we made some fairly early calls uh, in terms of trying to secure uh, the protective personal equipment, um, in terms of uh, uh, putting a COVID infection um, screening desk at the at our practice, uh, which initially was a, a, a kind of a novelty, and patients and staff were laughing. But as things developed, uh, people saw that how serious the situation was, and that. That, that really that anticipation um, started to, to build trust. Um, we took a, a fairly early call um, to close the practice to anything other than uh, emergency dentistry, mm -hmm. um, which uh, which was a big call. That's that's probably you know ninety percent of our business. Uh, wow. We 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 just sort of uh, we stopped. Um, and uh, that really demonstrated that we were putting the health and safety of our of our patients and of our staff uh, to the fore. Um, that obviously created um, trust there, but a, a lot of concern. There was genuine fear for our staff um, about the, the appreciated that you know with that level of change in business that um, you know job security was difficult. So. Uh, we will we addressed that in the, in the only practical way that uh, we could by uh, guaranteeing at least six weeks off off work um, for everyone, um, and that was independent of whether they actually could come in or not. Uh, some people were looking after vulnerable and uh, elderly relatives or, or, or young children, so um, we told those people if if they couldn't come in to stay at home. And um, we, any staff that were clinical, were were coming in on a on a purely voluntary basis, um, and look, the response to that was fantastic. In fairness to our staff, we a lot of hands, a lot of hands went up. Um, uh, we were mightily, mightily relieved when the the government subsidy uh, top up scheme came in. That really, that really uh, helped us, and it, it sort of allowed us to sort of continue uh, what we've been doing. Um, the next, uh, it sounds like some fairly tough decisions now, and, and you were, I mean, they were, they were pretty brave in terms of not knowing what, how this was going to play out. Yeah. Well, like, you know, um, our, our industry was, was, was devastated, um, by this. We're obviously in very close proximity to patients, um, and, 
because of the nature of this disease, which is poorly understood, um, a lot of people were, uh, you know, had no symptoms, but were infectious. Uh, and um, we were hearing from colleagues in China uh, about um, certainly ENT specialists were, were, you know, being very badly affected by this um, and dentists as well. And then when that played into Italy, we, we just knew that there was there was trouble here and, and until we could uh, really secure um, sort of top grade uh, PPE um, and have a better understanding of of this uh, of the disease that we, we couldn't in good conscience sort of continue to continue to practice now I guess because of our scale uh, we were able to put things in place to allow us to continue to do it to at least do the emergency work. And um, I know that uh, many friends and, and colleagues had to close their practices uh, completely and, have, and, are, and are still closed. Um, with the size of our patient base, um, closing would have been very difficult. We, we're, we're like even every day we're dealing with some you know, serious dental emergencies that would be ending up in uh, accident emergencies really if, 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 uh, if, if we weren't here. For them, so we did. We did have that uh, responsibility, but yeah, we, there was a few days around the, the first week or so of March that were, um, you know, extremely uh, difficult. Um, and in hindsight, just I think uh, we did make some reasonable calls at that time. Um, the survey was fantastic. Time enough, it was fantastic because we were very much in uncharted waters, uh, unsure of what what whether we were doing were right, whether our staff were were appreciative of it and um, where, where they were at with it. So to get the feedback that we did um, was, was a great a sort, of, sort of confidence boost. Um, you really demonstrated the extent to which you can be trusted by anticipating um, some of the challenges and, and demonstrating yeah. that in that regard. And that, that was a, that, that was a, there was a little bit of, you know, maybe fortune with that. Um, you know, the, the next part, like sort of having that trust and having the staff on board, um, building a, a kind of a remote workforce and setting up that technology and, and, and just the culture of working from home is something that's completely alien in, in, in dentistry. Obviously, um, I'm no use without my chairs and my tools and all the rest. So the dentists uh, were, were, that were covering the emergencies had to come in, but uh, you know our management did a really outstanding job in uh, setting up a, a remote front of house, um, which was complicated. It was uh, you know the the the, uh, the technology aspect of it, you know, setting up the VPNs, getting computers out to people, and um, was difficult. But then just uh, training people and how to use them and keeping morale up because if we felt that, you know, people were, were phoning um, our staff, they weren't at the front desk, they were sitting at home and we felt that it was really important that uh, we maintain that level of customer service and that professionalism um, that we've tried to build up over, over the years since we started. Okay. And what would your advice be in, in terms of your experience so far, given your sort of unique I suppose, insight into both the sort of medical implications and the customer implications and the staff implications. I mean, what, what two or three things would you pick out and say, look, these, these are really worth paying attention to? Well, I think, you know, uh, gaining the staff's trust was absolutely fundamental. Um, and, you know, from an early stage, we, uh, we'd sort of almost disregarded uh, the, the sort of uh, commercial challenges that we were facing and just put health and safety um, you know to the fore um, building that trust then uh, sort of was, was the platform um, on which then we were able to get people on board to really change the way they worked quite dramatically um, communication was absolutely huge as well um, I suppose from our previous uh, group based work surveys, um, it's an area where we always had work to do on. Um, so we uh, really worked hard and, and our managers really worked hard with that. Um, there was a one-on-one -on -one or a Zoom call with every staff um, from, from early on. 
we had regular Zoom meetings uh, with all the departments and even instructional videos that the managers uh, shot and then sent to staff, um, you, you know, to, to show them how, how, to, how, to, how to work things, how things should, should function um, and, and new tasks that they needed to do. And um, we were always very active with the group messaging as well. And that's both to keep people abreast of, um, you know, the more serious situations, but also, you know, for the more lighthearted stuff as well, to kind of keep morale up. Um, the, uh, we tried to keep updates from management as regular as possible um, in the forms of pre-recorded videos um, to talk about what was going on in the business, what we were trying to do. Um, and and that was always with a lot of honesty because um, no one really knows what is what was happening each week. There's there's new developments and there's twists and turns. So we were very open. Said that we didn't know um, what you know we didn't know we didn't have the answers to every everything. We tried to get get ahead of things as much as possible, but that wasn't always possible. Um, and then uh, you know we've done things like had. Friday drinks and things like that over over Zoom, um, which you know isn't quite as good as the real thing, but uh, it was it has to do at this time, you know. Um, and then, as as Mary said, we try to encourage uh, you know personal and professional development as much as possible. Like a lot of our dentists just you know haven't been working, so um, I've been trying to find uh, good online resources. Um, for them to look at a lot of the the key opinion leaders in the dentistry world are doing online videos and instagram videos and zoom uh, lectures for free to to sort of uh, help people out so you know there's there's been a lot of that but um you know we've been uh, mainly in sort of survival mode so we haven't we haven't got to the, the sort of online exercise uh, classes and things like that just yet Maybe maybe in the coming weeks. It sounds like you're busy, you know, busier than ever in some ways. Now. Well, our our, our CEO Sean is it's she's working from dusk to dawn, um, absolutely. Um, as our you know our, our other managers, uh, Vicky and Nikki, they're um, ab- absolutely working more than ever before. And um, you know, there's a lot of people that are doing jobs that they weren't hard to do. And they're very much working outside of their their job spec, um, and you know the way that they've uh, embraced that is 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 fantastic. You know, so uh, we just want to keep that going. One of the things we've heard from clients is that top performers are out, you know, are really distinguishing themselves in this particular context and showing great adaptability and so on. Um, and thank you very much. Yep. Before you move on, we've just got one um, question in from somebody just a, a little bit around the communication piece, I think, because Niall and Mary have, have both spoken into it already. Um, so we have somebody who is doing a weekly update with staff. Um, they're kind of getting those communication messages out. They're, they're using Zoom, so they're, they're uh, doing the, not worried about the hackers either. Um, but they're finding, they're, they're giving the opportunity for people to ask questions through the chat or whatever it is, but they're not getting that engagement from staff. Um, I don't know whether yourself or Niall and Mary have anything around ways to encourage that that kind of feedback from people on those weekly meetings. Well, from the way that we've looked at it, we've, we've tried to keep a, a good blend of um, more lighthearted stuff, um, social things and, and a more serious uh, messaging. Um, that's sort of how we've approached it, and it, it's very different from what we're, what we're used to. Um, usually, everyone's under the same roof here, so um, all meetings are face to face traditionally, and we do try to make an effort of getting around all of all of the staff and cycles. So um, it was a it was a big change uh, for us. Um, we do have a very active WhatsApp group. I know it's a it's a sort of a, a crude kind of a business tool, but it it it, it works well. Um, I think uh, if it's just kind of a, a one-off group communication, it mightn't, um, you know, it, it, it might seem a little, a little serious or, or, or something like that, you know. Mary? Yes, and uh, we would send out agenda items in advance asking people to reflect on any particular points that they may have. 
Um, we also um, encouraged the team to organize the meeting and to chair it and uh, prepare the agenda in that way. Um, their colleagues or their peers are more inclined to, let's say, um, ask questions if at a minimum as a support to, uh, to them. Um, and, and I agree with Niall, I think, um, you know, the, the, the formal meeting doesn't have to be the, the sole uh, point of communication. So it can be uh, a get together on Zoom uh, informally. Um, it can be your, your, your one to one meeting, uh, every opportunity to communicate with the team, be it as a group or individually, I think is, uh, is, is important during this time. Okay. Great. Una, can I, can I come to yourself next? Um, tell me about your experience in terms of the past while. Well, first and foremost, thanks million for the opportunity for coming on. Um, I suppose how it's been for us, it's, it's been a bit of a whirlwind, really. Um, uh, it's, we, I feel like we're caught in the eye of a storm, really, because, um, well, we're a pharmacy business, as, as you know. We have 96 staff, as you said before, Jim, um, nine stores, physical pharmacies, and then um, an online offering, Mars.ie, which was successful before COVID-19, but because consumers are staying at home now, um, the online store has li literally exploded, is all I can say. So basically, it is just um, ramped up to a whole new level, um, which is fantastic. In, in so many ways, but it is also challenging because we need to make sure that we are, um, I suppose, so have new processes in place there to socially distance and keep our staff and everybody um, safe and well in, in the, the online, I suppose, operation, but also to make sure that we are delivering for our customers and we have ramped up our resources to be able to respond to that huge customer um, demand. So I suppose if we rewind it all back, we've seen this, like Niall, very early on being in healthcare. Um, we've seen what was happening in China. We were watching that kind of thinking before Christmas, my God, God love China, you know. But then once we've seen glimmers of it anyway outside of China, we knew it was on its way. Um, we also, because we're pharmacists, we would keep very well attuned to, I suppose, the differences between COVID-19 and any other um, infectious disease, um, how it's transmitted. And, and very early on, we seen that this was on its way and this was, this was a huge, huge risk. Um, so we set up a COVID response team at the very beginning. Um, so a team of our, a, a small number of our senior management team on that response team, um, being primarily um, looking after our people and health and safety um, was, was paramount and our operations um, manager would be on there as well. And that was really established in order to protect our people first and foremost and to protect our customers. So it was really geared towards the health and safety of um, our, our team first and foremost so to make sure that um, if patients were coming in and like Niall said a lot of patients are asymptomatic so they don't have the fever the cough and so on and so forth so we need to treat every single person coming through our doors as if they were COVID positive okay. and wow. so from a very early stage we were we were doing that um, and we were putting those changes in place in our stores to customers who were maybe behind the curve and didn't really understand what we're doing. Similar to what Niall was doing, having that sort of reception desk. And we were explaining to our, our, our staff who may not have seen the impact of this coming as well, why we were doing that. Um, and so we started, first and foremost, our head office function, we removed them and got them to work remotely from I think it was the week beginning the 9th of March before even Leo made the announcement, we were out of there already because we've seen actually the impact that that would have on our online team because we run our online operation with our head office function within the same building. And we knew if our online people went down or if we infected our online people, the whole the wheels would come off the show, you know? So basically we took everybody from head office and, and we, and we we got them to work from home and um, we had to obviously change t technology systems make sure they were enabled and had all the tools to do that and that was that was tricky for that week and and leading up to that we were able to to, to do that quite effectively and explain to them why they were working from home and how now they were going to be able to communicate with their managers and with the wider team 
so that that has been a challenge and what i would say there is some people have taken to that really well and are so much more productive working from home and some people really crave the the, the personal you know human to human interaction so it, it's not a one size fits all i would say there and um and we're constantly just checking in with people there just to make sure that they're doing okay and they have all the tools that they need is a technology working is anything wrong with their computer do they need to get access to something in the office? How can we get that to happen? All of that. So just to make sure that they're enabled and they can do the work that they can do. Um, then when it comes to the stores, obviously, as I said, um, we have to treat as if everyone has COVID-19 walking through the doors. So we are working in retail, but we're in the healthcare division of retail. So we are an essential service. Um, so we um, are open. We find ourselves in a very surreal situation. We're open and we're telling people we're open and accessible, but we're telling them not to come in. Right, okay. Very unusual in retail. You know, we're always trying to drive football in retail, but we're now telling them don't come in near us. Sure. So don't come near us if you think that you have COVID-19. Don't come near us. So I suppose before we went into the, the restrictions we're now in, we were telling our customers don't come near us because you may have COVID-19 and you may infect a vulnerable patient who is already in our pharmacy. So even if you think that you're okay, don't be coming in in case you infect someone else. Right. So that meant that our entire business model had to change, had to change pretty much overnight. Um, and so now what we are really doing is instead of telling people to come in to us or to access our services, we've had to basically tell them to phone us, to email us, to get in contact with us and we will bring the products to you. So we are, have moved to a complete delivery service of prescriptions, right down to your toothbrush, your deodorant, absolutely everything. You contact us, we will get the product to your door. So essentially we are the pharmacy that will come to you now. And I suppose what that has led to, um, Jim, is you know we have engaged with our people around why we were doing this initially because you know, it's very strange for them where there's, we're, we're, we're saying, you know, please don't t tell the customers if you think that they ha have COVID or somebody, because we've had customers who have come in to say that, yeah, I am COVID positive, uh, I tested positive, I'm here to get paracetamol. Like that's an awful position to put our team in, you know, so we have a patient in saying that they're COVID positive, almost flippantly, not taking it seriously and putting our team members at risk. Right. So, you know, that, that, has been, that has been a challenge. So we have been trying to communicate well, really hard with our, cost, or with our um, team members to explain what do you do in scenarios like that. So really, we have tried to take the bull by the horns and go out and say, don't come in. Just don't come in because we don't know if that situation is going to arise. So I suppose what has happened as a result of that, and I suppose from engaging with all our team and, you know, Mary Ann and Niall said it, our managers have been absolutely critical in all of this um, because they are the people who are leading in, in each of the individual stores and in the online offering as well. You know, how do we make sure that we don't, can still look after our customers and our patients because they are the most vulnerable in society? How can we look after them and continue to serve them as we would do normally, but in a very different way? And some of the best innovations have come out of that whole experience. And it is back down to people our people are our best asset without any question. They have come up with the most cleverest ways of doing business and of looking after our patients at this crazy, crazy time um, so that we can continue to serve them actually even better than what we were doing before, but in a very different way. And so they are the people um, who have come up with all these new innovative ideas that, that has basically actually springboarded our business so that, you know, we, when this is all over, we'll, we'll totally come out of, uh, uh, out of it in a, a very different business, but a very, uh, I suppose, agile, adaptive business as well. And we've done that really because we have engaged with our team from the get-go to explain what it was, what, what, what were the problems. Um, and it's two pronged, you know, as Niall said, the commercial is one aspect of it that we're telling them about just so that they're aware, because a lot of people are concerned they may be married or their partners have lost their job or, you know, so their, their financial situation has really changed in their household. And so there's a huge amount of concern um, 
within our workforce, not necessarily for their particular job, but just, you know, what has happened in bigger picture because maybe their loved one has lost their job. So we've been really transparent with, I suppose, the commercials on our business, the impact of this to, to the business, but more importantly, the human aspect of it, you know, um, and, and explaining to them how actually the health and safety of them is the most important thing because without them, we can't continue to open the stores and to be there to serve our customers. So if you're putting the uh, health and safety out front and yeah. then allowing the cream to rise to the top in terms of driving innovation and the focus on managers has been really important. Yeah. So some of the things that they have come up with, Jim, like we've established this helpline. They said, what if we just get a helpline? Everybody phones there. Tell us what, what, what problem you have and we'll field it out to the relevant stores and, and we'll solve that problem. So we have established a helpline, a phone number and an email address. Anybody can phone into it about if you want a toothbrush, if you want a deodorant, or if you need your prescription, your anti-cancer medicines, you know? So it doesn't matter what it is. We have a team of pharmacists there and a team of people who are taking those calls and they will field it out if it's some a customer who has come in from Baggett Street, one of our stores, to Baggett Street to deal with, or if it's a, a, somebody outside of the nine stores, a brand new customer, we will look after them there as well. So we now basically can deliver your prescriptions and the, the, the legislation has changed, the Minister of Health has changed this because of COVID-19. We can now electronically accept a prescription, whereas beforehand, we used to have to have the paper format from dentist, doctor, hospital. Um, but now we can set, the doctors, everybody can send that to us electronically through a secure HSC um, uh, email address. We can dispense it and we are now putting it in a box and delivering it directly to the customer's door. If, if it's in Dublin, it's same day delivery, free service. And if it's outside of Dublin, it's 48 hours. So it's... Okay. I'm, it, I'm, it's I'm going to the time there, Runa, so I'm going to move on if I can and yep. come back around to the questions afterwards. But it's great to see that innovation yep. and, you know, the necessity being the mother of invention and then driving that and making that available. And it's a critical service that you're providing in terms of, of the well-being of, of, of um, all the patients and so on and so forth. So, so, so thank you for that. Um, Joseph, if I if I could come to to yourself next, um, you you could you just give us the background in terms of the survey that that, that we launched recently, and just to give people a quick, I'm going to move into giving people a quick overview of our findings in terms of uh, across the numbers. Uh, absolutely. Um, first, I'd just like to say to everyone um, on behalf of the client services team here, we've been delighted to provide the tool to support the community, um, and the feedback we've gotten from you all has really made it all worthwhile. And um, so, thanks for that. Just a little bit of about how we've actually gotten here and um, initially once the, the COVID crisis struck and uh, we realized that it was going to be quite a quite a serious uh, crisis we wanted to um, I suppose provide support to the organizations we work with and give them something um, to help them listen to their staff. We collaborated with a few of our other affiliate offices around the network um, and we really wanted to put something together with really low boundaries to help organizations roll it out quickly and gather that feedback um, from their employees. So what we did is we put together some statements that already existed in the survey that were relevant and also crafted some that are more relevant to what's going on at the moment. Um, I have been asked um, by a couple of companies if the tool is still available. Um, it will be available to organizations for as long as it's useful and relevant, which seems to be a while yet. Um, uh, the crisis is ongoing. So um, absolutely, if you want to, to make use of it, just get in touch with me. Now, having looked at the registration list, I'm aware that there's a mix of organizations on this call. Some are currently live with the survey, some have closed it off. And um, I know there's a few that are actively reviewing the survey at the moment and making a decision on that. And um, so I'll just run through the logistics of what the survey actually looks like and um, how you can roll it out in your own organization and, and uh, how you can uh, avail of it if, if you're interested in it. It'll be provided to you as a single link and um, that really cuts down the admin in terms of prepping up any filters or anything in the back end, we simply give you a link that you can build into the internal communications that you're already doing with your staff. And it means you can really within a day, get that rolled out to all your team. And um, it doesn't affect your great place to work assessment in any way at all. So don't be afraid of engaging with it or being worried that there might be negative feedback out of it. It's totally separate. It's a tool to support your team at this time. And um, because of the nature of the single link, we won't be able to break it down by any departments. 
and it's it's really an overall organizational view that you'll get but there are demographic filters at the end of the survey so we'll be able to split out stuff like job level gender if there's any caring or financial responsibilities for anyone in your organization because of the nature of it and um, it's being deployed uh, being designed for rapid deployment so there's no one size fits all approach to it um, but what we do is we can't customize it but participants are able to skip over any of the statements that aren't relevant to them. So because of the nature of it, um, it can be rolled out quite quickly in your organization. Um, if you were interested in partaking in it, just ping me over an email. I could get a link to you today. Realistically, if you were to communicate it to your staff, say tomorrow, you could keep it open for a week. Um, and by next Friday, we'd be able to get that feedback to you. It's, it's a really quick turnaround that we're able to provide. But obviously, you can keep that link open for as long as it's relevant to your organization. Now, for those that have completed the survey to date, what they would have received back is a feedback report um, that you should all be familiar with from your engagement in the survey and also a comments report. Because it's a, a dynamic process at the moment, we haven't provided any benchmarking yet, um, but obviously Jim is just about to speak into the first round of benchmarking that we've done. There are a few more surveys that have closed over the past few days. So early next week, I'm going to do another round of the benchmarking and I'll be able to provide a benchmark report of that round too to any organizations that have closed so far, I'll follow up with that. So as I said, if you haven't engaged in the survey so far, or you'd like me to set it up for your organization, send me an email, I'll get you set up with it. Um, and now I'll pass over to Jim to speak into those preliminary findings. Fantastic, Joseph, thank you so much. And thanks for your, for your care with, with all the clients. Um, so, okay, so, so these, as we say, are preliminary findings. Um, so we've broken out the, the statements into just a couple of areas, which is, first of all, obviously communications, and we've highlighted the extent which that's so important in terms of the earlier discussions, and particularly for each of the clients who've been on this morning, Niall, Mary and Una, their ability to, um, I suppose, anticipate and then communicate really, really well are highlighted. Um, the organization's approach to putting people first uh, being coming in in th those organizations so far at 89%. Uh, I'm confident that the organization is managing the impact of COVID-19 effectively 90%. And I feel well informed uh, about the impact on our organization 91%. So an excellent, very positive response so far in terms of, 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 of the responses. Um, I think one of, the, one of the things I will talk about in a moment is that the comments are particularly interesting across the organizations and give actually an exceptional level of insight into terms of what people, how diverse people's experience is. Um, so in here, obviously well-being is, is rating so important at the moment that people are paying such attention to it. Um, a lot of actions uh, that, that, that different organizations are taking to, to, to support people in such challenging and stressful times. And these three statements uh, I suppose focus on that. I, I know, um, for example, I've got I've got an eight year old, and he's hoping for a parental divorce at the moment. So uh, you know, any flexibility that there is in terms of of uh, delivering in terms of homeschooling, let's say in our particular situations, for is, is is one of the challenges that we haven't experienced to the same extent before. And certainly, in second class, I've reached my level of Irish that I remember from school. So. Um, so here, the, the level of flexibility that's uh, really, you know, kind of landing really well in terms of people's uh, well-being. Um, so those numbers are, are, are very, very high. There's this thing about personal health, which is interesting about each individual having taken responsibility for their own health. And that's varying a bit within organizations. Uh, into the, the next piece is in terms of the organization support that organizations are providing. Um, again, these numbers are, again, very, very solid. So people are very, very positive at the moment and, and probably more positive than we might have anticipated before we actually ran the survey. Um, and you particularly see the extent to which we are pulling together at the moment. It'll be interesting to see how that develops to some extent. Uh, and this is one of the things Mary touched on earlier is you know, the extent that, that might change over time according as organizations uh, adapt and uh, their, their different circumstances come to the fore. But right now people are feeling quite together about stuff. And I feel my concerns are listened to. Uh, for all of you that are very familiar with building high trust organizations, being listened to is such a critical element to, um, 
to creating trust in a great workplace. So we see that coming in in some organizations a bit lower than the, than the broadcast outgoing information. So some organizations are demonstrating being better at getting information out there than getting information back in. And uh, that's, that's something to, to continue to pay attention to. Um, the, the statement in here in, in this short survey that is, I suppose, varied most between clients and most in, within individual uh, circumstances and is referred to most in terms of comments is the first one here. So when, when working remotely, I mean, everybody wants to, uh, we work from the basis that everybody wants to do good work. And when working remotely, it is easy for me to be as effective as, as I am when working uh, where I usually do varies very substantially within demographics, within clients and between clients. And I think this is certainly something um, that I would encourage organizations to pay attention to in terms of what we have seen so far, both in terms of the statements and in terms of the actual comments. And uh, that's, that's what I want to move on to sort of a key piece uh, to, to talk about that. We've spoken about the importance of managers and managers are giving clear direction, um, but in the question of how the extent to which they're getting into individual conversations with people in terms of figuring out their individual circumstances and to the extent to which it's possible supporting people to do their best work while this is going on. Uh, and it, that plays out in so many different ways. Uh, we'll share these comments with you afterwards. They're just a sample of comments, but as I say, the comments have been particularly rich and, uh, and, and really, really interesting in terms of peop things people are paying attention to. Um, uh, but generally speaking, overwhelmingly positive that people understand the challenge and how difficult it is to manage in such a dynamic situation and are really appreciative of the extent to which organizations have put their health and well-being first. Um, but bringing all those numbers together and looking at, okay, so what are the practical implications? One of the things that, that, that we would be asking organizations to and pay very specific attention to and maybe have a, a very, you know, quite a detailed conversation with their managers uh, and how it is that they sort of track and work on um, this dynamic situation is the one-to-ones really are critical because by definition, an office brings people together, uh, a, a retail environment brings people together and brings them together in a very structured way where it, it irons out a lot of the differences. But given that people are dealing with such variable situations at home, both in terms of their significant others or maybe their physical constraints, uh, broadband and home office, um, you know, different workloads in terms of caring for people, uh, doing homeschooling, and then how it is people have different propensities to deal with stress and ambiguity. Um, we're beginning to see elements of people being concerned about what a return to work looks like and what it would be like uh, for me to commute in, in public transport, for example. And I suppose one of the things that I'd also like is while this situation is new, we see the competencies that organizations have built up in terms of embracing diversity and having varied conversations is really helpful to leverage into this context. So seeing how it is that you can approach people on a one-to-one -one basis and being quite varied and as flexible as possible in terms of your response and tracking that, uh, you know, is, is, uh, is going to be really useful and you know managers know how to do that already but sometimes it's not obvious to do that mapping of crosses to say here's the skill I already have I can apply it in this context. Another one that you see kind of coming across quite strongly depending on, uh, on uh, people's uh, I suppose uh, Una mentioned it earlier is to say whether or not you uh, let's say really value or the extent to which you really value that personal contact. And so feelings of isolation and lack of camaraderie rate sort of quite highly in terms of people's concerns. So a couple of things we'd say in relation to that one, one of the ways is, is just to, to absolutely stress what the organization's about and purpose is always important in terms of uniting people. So it's easy to forget that, you know, for most organizations, their purpose or their outcome or their strategy may not have changed at all. It's just how it is that they're working and how it is that they're doing that is, is the thing that's changed. Um, 
so there's an opportunity to re reinforce, I suppose, purpose and inclusion. And then the last piece is, is around getting the job done. So what does that look like now? And just being really clear about expectations in the context of all that environment. So there is an opportunity here, as Una had mentioned, to build resilience into the organization in this particular context. And that's, that, that's probably the opportunity that we see now. I also noticed that I'm right up against time, so I'm not sure if uh, Fanny has any questions there for us. As, as, as it's, I mean, it's clear that there's a lot in this. We will be doing more follow-up as according as this, uh, as we've more data in, and probably depending on your feedback, you can get into different elements of this depending on what you tell us that you'd like to hear more about. Absolutely. Uh, thanks, Jim, for that. I am aware it's, it's 11 a.m., so we will begin to wrap up. And um, thank you to our panellists who are actually answering people's questions live. I think that's been really helpful to, to keep the questions answered. And there's a couple of themed ones coming in. And what we'll do is we'll collate them all and it'll actually help us build out our content moving forward. So um, if it wasn't answered today, we will answer it in the future um, and we'll make sure that, that all those questions get answered. Um, so to wrap up, I would like to thank our expert panel. Um, I, I, I can see people coming in here um, to say thank you to me directly. Don't thank me. Thank our panel. I did nothing except sit here at the start and the end. So Niall, Mary, Una, thank you very much. Um, Joseph, thank you for taking us through um, the process and Jim for kind of fielding the whole thing today. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, as usual, the recording and the slides will be available afterwards. Um, and we are going to finish out today a little bit differently um, because we never, we never try to do the same thing twice. So um, thank you all for being with us. Thanks to our panelists. Um, and we're gonna leave you with this video. So goodbye everybody. Thank you very much.